So today, I want to speak a message to you that I've entitled, When We All Get to Heaven. When We All Get to Heaven. I'm going to start on a high note. We're going to go today to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 1. In the scriptures, they read this way. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth before you grow old and say, Life is not pleasant anymore. Remember Him before the light of the sun, the moon, and the stars is dim to your old eyes. And rain clouds continually darken your sky. Remember Him before your legs, the guards of your house, start to tremble. And before your shoulders, the strong men stoop. Remember Him before your teeth. Your few remaining servants stop grinding. And before your eyes, the woman looking through the windows see dimly. Remember him before the door of life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Now you rise at the first chirping of the birds, but then all their sounds will grow faint. Remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets, before your hair turns white like the almond tree in bloom, before you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper and the caper barrier berry no longer inspires sexual desire. Remember him before you near the grave, your everlasting home, when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, remember your Creator now while you are young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well, for then the dust will return to the earth and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. One weekend, about eight and a half years ago, Sarah and I, we, uh, we were still dating, and uh, we, had, we were living in Moncton, and Sarah wanted to come up home for a weekend. She wanted to come up here and visit her family, and so she asked me if I'd like to go up for the weekend, and, and so I agreed, and, and we went, and we jumped in a car together, and up we came. It was just going to be a weekend for Sarah, just a weekend to visit her family, but what she didn't realize was that weekend was going to be a weekend She'd probably never, ever forget. See, that Saturday morning, Sarah was sleeping, and I, I kind of snuck into her room, and I, I sat on the edge of the bed, and I kind of poked her and woke her up. And uh, if anyone knows Sarah, sometimes Sarah wakes up a little grumpy. And so Sarah woke up, and I began to tell Sarah how important she was to me and how much I loved her. And then I presented her with a ring. And I asked Sarah... To be my wife. See, in that instant, immediately, plans were being made. Right? Immediately, plans were being made for our future. But there was two things in particular that we were planning that day. For an entire year, we started planning for a wedding and for a honeymoon. Right? And so we planned for a year. And, and if anyone knows Sarah, again, Sarah's detailed, very detailed person. And so we had everything figured out. We had the lawn care figured out. We had where, the, where our arbor was going to be that we were going to stand under. We knew how she was going to come out of the home. We knew where she was going to be in the morning of the wedding and how we were going to meet out there. And we got married in the backyard. So we had all the grooming figured out and everything was ready to go. And all that planning. For a whole year, we planned right down to the exact detail, and it lasted 25 whole minutes. It came and it went so fast, it was like a blur. The honeymoon, we we planned, and we were going to go away for two weeks. For two weeks, we were going to go away. We knew exactly where we were going to go. We were going to go to the Bahamas, to Grand Bahama Island. We had it all planned out. We booked all of our flights. We had the, the resort all booked out. We knew exactly what we were going to do. We, we looked at all the things that we could do when we were there from the, the snorkeling. And we looked at all the sights that we could see. We had it all figured out and we arrived in Grand Bahama Island looking forward to the next two weeks of honeymoon bliss. And on the second morning, we get a knock on the door. I go to the door and they said, Sir... We need you guys to come down to the main lobby. We went down to the main lobby. They informed us 
that there was a Category 5 hurricane going to hit our island. To give you an idea, the island before us was getting hit with waves that were 20 feet high. We were on an island at the highest point was 12 feet high. Not good statistics. Not looking good for old Drew and Sarah. So long and story short is this. Had everything planned out, and on the third day of our honeymoon, we were in a completely different country than we even planned on being in. Quick, just like that. See, I bring that up to say this. Could it be that this little moment in Sarah and I's life is actually a pretty accurate representation of life in general? We plan years in advance. We plan sometimes decades in advance. But in a moment, it can all end. In a moment, our whole life can be turned around. In a moment, all our plans can simply come to an end. It happens so fast. See, we've been working our way through this series that I've entitled Hymn Book Theology. And what we're doing is we're talking about some very important doctrines of the Christian faith. And I'm just simply listing it or naming it as a famous hymn to help us remember. But the reason we're going through this and the reason it's so important to know doctrine is because so many people have walked away from the Lord claiming that the Bible is not true, claiming that God is not faithful, that the same God that they know about does not exist. But in reality, God has never changed. God is always faithful. The Bible is always true. Where it falls is the fault falls on us, not on God. See, the truth is, we walk away many times Because we don't have a full understanding of what the Bible really teaches. So we've been working our way through some of these. We've talked about the grace of God. We've talked about the resurrection of Jesus and how one day we'll be resurrected. We talked about faith. We talked about sin. We talked about the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to end this series. And I want to talk to you about something very important. I want to talk to you about the afterlife. I want to talk to you about what happens After this life ends. So see, the first place that you have to start on such an important topic as this is a simple statement. Everyone dies. Every one of us die. Ecclesiastes 12.6 says, Yes, remember your Creator now while you are young before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. For then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Solomon uses three illustrations to drive his point home. And these three illustrations are for those who are living in his time. And so I want to explain those three very quickly. The first one is the silver cord snaps and the golden bowl is broken. What scholars believe is in the temple that there were these large golden bowls that hung as decoration. They were hung by these silver cords. And so this expensive, beautiful golden bowl, at the snap of of the, uh, the silver cord, would come crashing down unexpectedly and shatter. The second one he used was the water jar smashes at the spring. Now, they would go for water, and they would go down to the spring to get water. Now, when they're going down to the water, they're going for a purpose, aren't they? They're going down to get water for their family, for their friends, for their visitors. They're going down to get it for their cattle. They have a very distinct reason and purpose they're going down. And so they go down, and they have these plans, but they get down to the waterway. They kneel down, and for whatever reason, their jar is smashed, and immediately their plans are no more. Their plans are done. They, they're over. He uses a third one. He says, the pulley is broke at the well. Again, the well was in the middle of the town or in the middle of the area, and they would go to these wells, and they would, they would get their water for their cattle. They would get the water for visitors or their family or their friends. And so he's bringing this illustration that they've, they've walked to the well, and they have this plan. 
I'm going to go, I'm going to get the water out of the well, I'm going to fill my jars, I'm going to... You know, they had their day planned out. They had things planned out that they were going to do, but immediately they get there, the pulley is broken, and their plans are over. Their plans are done. See, they all point to the exact same thing. We make plans in our lives. We make all of these plans in our lives, but they can end in an instant and without warning. James 4, 14 says this, How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It is here a little while, then it's gone. See, I sometimes wonder if so many people can walk away from their relationship with Jesus with such ease because they don't really realize the frailty of life. They don't understand and they don't realize how quickly life can end and how easily it can end. See, the truth is, is we all expect to live into our 70s, our 80s, our 90s. My life, I'm in my 30s, and I look and I think I'm probably half, I've got half of my life probably lived. So I still have half a life to live yet. I can still accomplish so much more in life for the Lord with with what I have. And we all think of these things, don't we? We start new jobs and we think about retirement. We think about what's going to come in the next few months or the few years, a few decades. But how would your perspective and how would your view on life change and how would your view on the afterlife change if you found out you only had a few months to live if you knew you only had a few months to live how would your perception of life change in the afterlife what about if you only found out that you had days to live you weren't even going to live the week you only had days to live how would, your, how would your mindset change? How would your perception of the afterlife, how would your perception of your life here on earth and what you want to accomplish, how might that change? What about this? What if you were told you only had hours to live? If you weren't even going to live through this day, how would that change your perception on life? How would that change your perception on what's to come after this life. See, it leads us to the next very important detail about the doctrine of the afterlife. Once we realize the frailty of life, once we realize how fragile life is, that it can end in a moment, the next thing we realize is it might be time to adjust our priorities, right? Ecclesiastes 12 Verse 1 says this, Don't let the excitement of youth youth, cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth before you grow old and say, Life is not pleasant anymore. Imagine someone sits down to watch their favorite TV show. It's the series finale. Or maybe you've sat down and, and the playoffs are going on right now in basketball and in hockey. And so you, your favorite team is in the playoffs and you've been waiting for this game. and You've been waiting all day. And so you sit down and you're watching your show or you're, you're watching your, your game. And there's only a few minutes left and the phone rings. And you pick up the phone and on the other line they say, Hi, um, I regret to inform you that your spouse has been in a very serious car accident. Or they say, I regret to inform you that your child has been in a very serious car accident. They're on their way to the hospital and we don't think they're going to make it. So you hang up that phone. Now, are you going to turn to your TV and say, there's only 10 minutes left in my show. This is the series finale. I've been waiting forever. I've been watching this show for like seven seasons. 10 minutes won't make a difference. Are you going to look at it and say, I've been waiting for this game all day. All day I've been waiting for this game. I'm just going to watch the rest of this game and then I'll go. Never in a million years, would you? The moment you hung up that phone, you could care less what's on TV. You could care less about the game and you would care, le- could, you would care nothing at all about your show. 
all that would go through your mind is, I have got to get to the hospital. I have got to see my loved one. See, all of us would say the same thing, and I think we would all say this, that we have got our priorities figured out. See, if someone said they would sit and watch the game, the first thing you would think is, man, they need their priorities fixed, right? But we think we have our priorities figured out, but do we really? Do we really? See, Solomon was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he says this. Don't let the excitement of your youth cause you to forget your Creator. In other words, don't let that drive for success, that drive for wealth, the drive for a large family cause you to forget your Creator. Don't let that drive for freedom of choice, freedom of speech, your pursuit of a retirement, your pursuit for fame or recognition, your pursuit and and needing that new car or that new house. Don't, Don't let the pursuit of earthly gratification and happiness cause you to forget your Creator. Is it possible that most people who turn their life from Jesus Christ, make this one simple mistake. They get their priorities mixed up just a little bit, and they forget the Creator. See, life is short. Life is very short. It can end in a moment. It can end unexpectedly. And what you prioritize in this life is going to have eternal consequences. Listen to what Timothy or uh, Paul said to Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, 7 and 8 says this, After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and enough clothing, let us be content. Now this is what Paul is not saying. And this is not what the Bible is saying. Having things is not wrong. Wanting to be successful is not wrong. Wanting to be comfortable in life is not wrong. Wanting to have a nice home and a nice car is not wrong. Wanting to, to, to have a big family so that you can have dinners together and you can enjoy time with them is not wrong. That is not what the Bible is saying. That is not what Paul said, and that is not what Solomon was saying. What Solomon was saying, and what Paul was trying to get across, is this. Make sure your priorities are right, and you don't forget your Creator in the pursuit of these things. You see the difference? See, I've heard it preached, and I've heard it taught, that it was almost wrong to want things on this earth. It was almost wrong to want to be comfortable. It was almost wrong to want to have nice things. But that's wrong. That's not what the Bible teaches. There's a very distinct line that's being drawn in the sand here. If those things become more important than your Creator, that is wrong. And what they're saying is, you can amass all of these things, you can pursue these things, But when that becomes more important than your Creator, when you die, you're leaving it all here on earth. You're not taking it with you. But see, it leads us in this doctrine of the afterlife to the final point that I want to talk to you about today. And it's that this life is just the beginning. See, when we begin to pursue things so much on this earth that we forget our Creator, what we are doing is we are forgetting that there is a whole other life beyond this one. This is where I want to close today. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son, that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. See, eternity is a word that we hear a lot in Christian circles. 
We talk about eternal life. We talk about eternity with Christ our Lord. We, we talk about eternal consequences that I just brought up. But in reality, we can't grasp with human reasoning eternity. Now you might think you can and you might understand the concept of it. But I want to help you grasp exactly how long eternity is. And to give you an idea, I'm going to use another number that's very big. A number that we hear all the time, but we fail to realize how big this number is. And the number is billion. We've all heard billion. We spend seven billion dollars here. Our government spends a billion dollars there. But do you really understand how big one billion is? So let me help you. One billion seconds ago, it was 1988. Elf was still popular on the airwaves. One billion minutes ago, it was AD 117. To give you an idea what that means is that the Apostle John just finished writing the revelation of Jesus Christ for the church about two decades earlier. The Bible wasn't even cantonized yet. They were still passing around these letters. One billion hours ago. How quickly does an hour pass? One billion hours ago, it was 114,808 years ago. 114,808 years ago. So if this number is that big, in our life in comparison to 114,808 years can seem so small, then when you begin to think of eternity, that number continues to go so small that as James put it, it's like the morning fog. It's here today, gone tomorrow. It's here today and gone tomorrow. See, what's amazing is in this brief amount of time, in the existence of humanity and the world that we live, we have this brief moment to make a choice. We have a brief moment to make a choice that is going to affect eternity. So you've got two choices. Let me give you two choices. If I gave you the choice of whether you would like to live in a brand new house. Brand new. It's got a beautiful view, two car garage, lots of land, beautiful flooring, washer, dryer, dishwasher, 5,000 square foot home. It was given to you for free and you're given a maid for free so you never have to clean that 5,000 square foot home. So that's your first option. Your second option is you can have a straw hut in the middle of a field, $500 a month rent with no insulation and no heat. Which are you going to choose? Everyone would say the home. In fact, some people are probably thinking, Drew, that's a little bit of hyperbole. You're exaggerating just a bit. That is ridiculous. That doesn't even make sense. You've gone too far. So let me give you the biblical choice that we're given. Would you rather live in eternity with no sorrow, no pain, surrounded by those you love, with no worry, no fear, in the presence of our Creator, on streets of gold, with never-ending joy? Or would you rather burn in an eternal fire, tortured by excruciating pain that never ends, in complete darkness, full of the most mind-numbing fear that you've ever experienced, full of sorrow, discouragement, and begging for even a drop of water to touch your tongue for even the slightest feeling of relief. Which would you rather? See, the Bible gives us an either-or. It says, when eternity comes, you are spending it, either in heaven or in hell. 
And in your brief moment on this earth, you get to choose. You get to choose. Which are you going to choose? Do you want to choose heaven today? Or do you want to choose hell today? See, life is far too short and life can end far too unexpectedly for you to wait another day. Don't wait another day. Choose life eternal today. Turn to Jesus. If I could have everyone stand... If I can have every head bowed and every eye closed. Sometimes in a message like this, it brings about the reality of two things. The shortness of life and the length of eternity. And sometimes it can get us thinking. This is going to be simple. If today you've decided that you haven't prioritized quite the way you should, and today you want to reprioritize, and today you want to rededicate or dedicate your life to Jesus, lift your hand where you're at and say, that's me, whether you're here or at home. Lord, eternity is a long time and I want to spend it with you. And God, I pray that every person who has heard this today and every person who will ever hear this, I pray, Lord, that their heart and their mind would be turned to you. Lord Jesus, we don't have long on this earth. Guide us. Draw us. Be our strength to turn to you, Lord. Lord Jesus, if there's anyone there that want to turn their life to you today, then God, I ask that you would forgive them of their sins. I pray, oh God, that you would come into their heart today and that, Lord, they would live their life committed to you in your ways all the days of this life on earth. If that was you, and you were home, or you were praying here silently, you need to know that if you have repented and you have asked Jesus into your heart, eternity of joy awaits you. Lord, we thank you for this blessing in your name. We pray. Amen.